Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word that we would consider this morning is our epistle reading from Philippians 2, 5 to 11. We would hear that one more time. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So far, God's word. Hillary Dean. Boy, has she got an attitude. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe it's been said of you. Boy, you better do something about that attitude, guy. It better change and better change quick. We aren't going to put up with that kind of stuff. Attitudes. We all have them, don't we? Usually when we're talking about somebody's attitude, it's not a good thing. We're usually talking about somebody who thinks pretty highly of themselves, <coughs> thinks very little of others, and usually does whatever they please, and nobody better get in their way. Not a good thing. And as we once again gather together to celebrate the entrance of our Lord into Jerusalem, that final week that we call Holy Week, the Apostle calls upon us to take some inventory of our attitude. And basically what he's telling us today is, you better change that attitude and you better change it quick. Well, that's pretty easy to say, isn't it? You know, we ask somebody and, or tell them, you better change that attitude, and we say, okay, how? You know, it's, it's not like going into your closet and deciding which attitude am I going to wear today. Oh, this one looks like it might work for whatever it is I'm going to do. An attitude isn't something that just comes and goes. It's something that has to be instilled deep within us. And it's something that takes effort, and not only an effort, but also a desire to change. If we don't have a reason to change or a desire, it won't. Today, the Apostle points to us and says, you need to change that attitude, and you need to change it because of one thing, and that is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He starts his reading by saying, have this mind within you. Have this attitude within you. He's not just talking any attitude. He's saying, this is the mind of Christ, and this is the mind you should have within you. Well, what is it? We're told Jesus emptied himself or made himself nothing. That's the attitude that Paul encourages us to have, the kind of attitude that Jesus had. That's why we, we look at it on this Palm Sunday, because it is displayed very clearly 
the kind of attitude that Jesus had. And I don't think we, we often grasp what it means when, when it says that Jesus emptied himself. I mean, look at it, think of it this way. Here is Jesus up in heaven in all of his glory, the angel armies bowing before him, singing praises. And his father comes to him and says, Son, I've got a job for you. He says, I've got a plan to rescue mankind. But it's going to take you to do it. Now, what I want you to do, son, the only way it can happen is for you to become incarnate. You, you have to become human. Now, now that means you, the eternal son, who fills all things everywhere, now have to shrink yourself down to be in the womb of a woman and be born a child so that you can grow up to become a man. You have to leave the timelessness of eternity and subject yourselves to the law of the world. The only way for this to work is for you to take the place of mankind. You have to set aside your divinity, your power and your glory, and you have to become the substitute. And not only do you have to do that, but you have to put yourself under the law that they are under, and you have to put yourself upon the cross, and you have to suffer the punishment that those law-breaking humans all deserve. How about it, son? You ready? He did it. He did it. Can you imagine? He gave that all up. It sounds totally improbable for Christ to give up absolutely everything, to empty himself. Seems totally impossible, and yet he did it. Paul says he didn't hang on to his glory clutching at it as if this was something that he had to hang on to and keep I'm the Son of God. I deserve glory. I deserve praise. I deserve all of that. And yet, he gave it up. He didn't insist on retaining all of his regal rights. His status, his glory, his equality with the Father and the Spirit. No. Even though he had a crown, he willingly traded it for a cross. That's fantastic. And even more fantastic than that is he did it willingly for us, and it wasn't a charade. It was for real. He wasn't like that, that mythical prince who came off of his throne and put on some beggar's rags and disguised himself so that everybody would think he was one of the guys, just so that he could wander around and see how the other half lived. It wasn't a play that he was choosing a part. It was the real thing. He became human, totally. 
but it didn't mean he stopped being God. Nor does it mean that he relinquished his power of God. That power was still there. As was testified by the miracles that he performed. He still had it, but he only used it for the benefit of others. He only used it to strengthen faith. He never used it for his own ends. He denied himself so that he might be under the full limitations of humanity, even death. Golgotha, the cross, the scourging, the pain was real. Jesus really emptied himself and became man for us. That's the miracle. He did it all for us. He emptied himself, suffered what we should suffer, bore our griefs, bore our sorrows. That's why in the gospel we hear this morning that he set his face resolutely. He went right to Jerusalem, knowing what awaited him. Knowing the scourging, the cross, the death, the suffering. As Paul reminds us, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. He offered himself, and for it all God approved. He approved by raising him from the dead on Easter morning. And beyond that it says that he gave him with that, gave him a name that is above every other name that have there has been or will be. The name at which every knee will bow. All. Both those standing around the throne and those suffering in hell will bow the knee and admit that Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Paul tells you this morning, have this mind among yourselves. Have that kind of an attitude. Paul said that deliberately because he knew what kind of people he was working with. It was, it was more than just a couple of ladies in the Philippian congregation, uh, Yodia and Syntyche that were in a squabble. But what was happening is because of this squabble, they were each trying to exert their own power, their own abilities. It allowed others to come in and start working false doctrine within the congregation. It started splitting the congregation up because everybody began to try and serve themselves, get their own credit, their own power. And the false teachers came in started preaching a false Christ. Not for the benefit of the people, but we're told that they were preaching out of envy and rivalry, looking for support and prominence and personal gain. That spirit that motivated those false teachers in Philippi lives on today. You know, like I said earlier, we all have attitude. An attitude that wants to be me first. I want to be in the center stage. I want everything done according to my will. And Paul tells us, let this mind be in you. You see, that's the answer to those kind of problems. It means emulating Christ. Having the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ means that we have an attitude of humility. Humility is referred to throughout the scriptures. But realize, humility doesn't mean people walking around, beating their breasts, and saying, oh, what a wretched person I am. 
Oh, I'm so terrible. I'm so humble. Humility is not denying our own worth. After all, in God's eyes, we are people of worth. And if you don't believe that, why in the world would Jesus have given up everything and died if he didn't think we were worth it? And beyond that, because of what he has done, what has he made us? The cross is incontestable proof that we are of value. Because of that, we have been made children of God, heirs of heaven. That is something that can never be taken away from us. We have dignity and nobility because we are heirs to the king. So what is the humility that we emulate? Humility means having a sober assessment of our own strengths and weaknesses. Knowing above all else how we are indebted to God and how without him nothing is possible. Humility is an attitude of the mind and heart, both to God and to each other. It means having a readiness to consider others first, to think of others over self. It means to get rid of that me first attitude to get rid of the thought process that says, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And instead, what's in it for somebody else? How can I be of service to somebody else? How does that square with the mind of Christ? Jesus emptied himself and gave himself up to the point of death. Are you ready to do the same? To empty yourself to ego, putting it to death, in order to see and respond to the needs of others. There's a famous entertainer that had a sign on his desk that says, I'm number three. Somebody says, well, what, what does that mean? He says, oh, it's simple. God first, others second, me third. Humility is counting others better than yourself. Have a mind of humility. And then, he says, become obedient. Jesus, in humility, became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. It's not that we don't have a mind for obedience. I mean, we already are obedient. But to the wrong laws. We're, we're obedient to the law of an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You pat my palm, and I'll pat yours. That's not the type of obedience. Christ says we are to be obedient to a higher law, to the law that he was obedient to, the law of love. Peter reminds us, to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he died, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Have that kind of mind in you. A mind that follows the law of love. 
It won't make you the talk of the town. See, the world doesn't much think much of that kind of thinking. In fact, if you don't retaliate and don't do something back, they kind of think you're a bit of a wimp. And why bother? But it's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of great strength. For it's pretty easy to treat others the way they treat you. Even the animals do that, right? You bite me, I'll bite you. That's pretty easy. What shows character is when we treat someone else better than what they treat us. Real character is to love as Jesus loved. To love no matter what. It takes big people to make that kind of a shift. You have heard it that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in you, in your family relationships, in your classroom, in your job, in work, or in play. Have a mind for obedience. Live the law of love and have a mind of humility. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. He will, you know. Just as he exalted his son. For that's the promise that he gives to all who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.